All right, let's get it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Mr. Andy Young, commentator Young Voices. Uh, interesting in the individual, Andy works as a legal fellow, a legal fellow at Tech Freedom, focused on technology law. Uh, he is a doctor of law, uh, living and working in DC. All right, should be fascinating. Andy, thank you for being on the show. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. Let's talk about Section 230 in its connection to platforms like Twitter. Freedom of speech, obviously now the Elon Musk situation where he's a free speech absolutist. Tell us how you see this variable and I will then respond. Sure, so in my opinion, section 230 should be Elon Musk's new favorite law. Mm -hmm. He is taking over Twitter so that he can change how Twitter moderates content on the platform. And section 230 is a law which allows him to experiment with content moderation without worrying about legal liability for his actions, which content he takes down, which content he leaves up. So section 230 will be essential and very important for what he plans to do with Twitter in the future. Let me ask you about your thoughts in reference to his ideology as a free speech absolutist. Are you in agreement with that form of free speech? Uh, in private companies? It really depends how you define free speech absolutist. Elon has said a few things which actually point different directions in terms right. of how he might moderate content. Mm -hmm. I think in general, having more speech on Twitter, less strict moderation will lead to more interesting conversations. However, I definitely believe it's important to take down harmful or offensive content before it incites any violence or any negative consequences like that. So. I'm not a complete absolutist, but I think it will be interesting to see what it looks like if we allow more speech on Twitter overall. So you agree with me uh, then that if you're not absolute, you're not an absolutist. If you go around saying, "Oh, I'm a free speech absolutist," but even in your own companies, you don't allow free speech absolutist doctrine. Elon Musk does not allow that. He has in NDAs, etc., restriction of speech. He has penalties for individuals that violate particular conversations and confidentiality that's connected to the company. So he only says he's a free speech absolutist when it comes to his dogma on social media. But here's the interesting dynamic. Let's go back to 230 and section 230 under the Communications Decency Act, the DCA. Section 230 basically says, all right, these social media platforms, they're not publishers, so they can't be held to the same standard as let's say a magazine or a newspaper because you have an editor, you have a curation process, etc. cetera. Um, so we're gonna hold you to a different standard which basically creates an immunity. Um, but these particular platforms are also frequented by children, right? So let me give a very narrow situation. Do you think that these platforms should allow for use of let's say the N word or racial slurs in general? without content moderation, should that be allowed? I think it depends on the context of the post. Uh, if they're if being offensive, let's say they're being post. offensive. They're trying to uh, intimidate a particular group, they're being degrading. What about in that context? Intimidating groups or trying to threaten individuals, certainly those posts should be taken down. And the use of the N word exacerbates the issue with those posts, however, you can make offensive or threatening posts without the N word as well. And those posts should be taken down as well as threatening content. Yep, um, so if someone says, um, I hate all N words, you're saying that post needs to be taken down. I'm saying that is in the purview of posts that should be looked at very carefully. And if that is against the ideology and views of the social media platform, they should take that post down. And if I ran a social media platform, I would take those posts down myself. Okay, let's go back to section 230 because it's interesting how this law works, right? Um, while it creates an immunity for the platform, remember section 230 really isn't for us, it's for the companies. Uh, it creates right. immunity for the companies. A judge has rules, so you have judicial common law now that says 230 is not actually absolute. Like we thought this was absolute. 
But we have judicial rulings that say it's not really absolute. These particular companies must engage in a good faith effort to moderate content. It doesn't mean they need to be perfect. It doesn't mean the execution has to be flawless. But it does mean they need to have some common sense rules. Because this is not the US government. This is not the town square as some conservatives have said or suggested. This is still a private company, but it has real world impact. Do you agree that these particular companies must engage in some level of self-regulation to maintain their immunity status as it relates to these various posts? Well, the, the way the law is written right now is you're correct. It's not a complete absolute immunity. There's some exceptions. For example, if a platform isn't just merely hosting the content, if they themselves edit the content or create the content, they can still be held liable for that. So I think that's the proper framework for it to be for it to be set up as. I think it's working okay as it is right now. Do you know the case of Barnes versus Yahoo? Are you familiar with that case? Not so familiar that I can speak about it on live television, but I have read it before, yes. All right, so this was a circuit decision back in 2009. And it kind of flipped our understanding of 230 in some way. Because Yahoo said, listen, we can't really be sued. We have automatic immunity here. And the court said, well, wait a minute. You failed to uphold a promise that you made. And so the way the court ruled was under the doctrine of promissory estoppel. Uh, and this was about new photographs online and they were told, hey, you gotta take them down. They said, okay, we'll take them down and they never did. I think the interesting dynamic for many of us who are experiencing kind of this new territory of social media is that there's a group who says all speech should be allowed. And I don't agree with that. I, I don't think, um, all legal speech should be allowed. I think if you are racist and you use racial slurs, you should not be allowed to remain on that content on that platform because of that content. Now remember, there's a user agreement. This user agreement lays out the rules. That's a contract, all right? You're a study man in the law. You voluntarily sign up for that contract. Nobody coerced you and there's no undue influence nor some kind of unequal bargaining power. So the contract is proper. When people say, when they violate me by taking me off of a platform, that's a violation of my free speech. You even had a former president of the United States, Donald Trump, filed an entire lawsuit based on that legal malarkey of a violation of free speech. What do you say to that for people who say this is a violation of their speech? Uh, that argument completely is incorrect. Uh, the, that's a First Amendment argument, and the right. First Amendment only applies to the government. The First Amendment prevents the government from interfering with speech on Twitter. The First Amendment does not prevent Twitter from taking users off of its own platform. In fact, the First Amendment protects Twitter's ability to do that. And of course, the First Amendment and Section 230 are distinct. But as you were saying earlier, um, platforms need the ability to take users off of their platform if they say offensive or dangerous things, or if they violate the user agreement. And Section 230's liability shield gives platforms the flexibility and the reassurance that they can apply their content moderation practices without later being sued by users who claim they're being treated unfairly. So both those laws work hand in hand, but overall I do not agree with people who say that Twitter has violated their right to free speech. That's just not how it works. Why do you think Donald Trump and his attorneys filed an entire class action lawsuit? And I say that word loosely, it was never determined to be a class action lawsuit by the judge. But why do you think they sought a class action lawsuit based on a premise that you have just said and I completely concur um, is false? I think it's legal theater. Mm -hmm. I think it's fodder for the culture wars. I think it's an opportunity for him to point to a lawsuit and say, hey, look, I'm doing something without uh, there actually being any results from it. And an and, opportunity to raise money. And an opportunity to raise money. It's a very complicated topic. So people cannot easily be explained that this lawsuit has no merit. So it's an opportunity to fundraise without him having to back himself up with much. I, I don't know, sir. I think you did a great job just saying, nope, that's not a violation of your freedom of speech. That's only if the government does it, all right? I, I don't think that's complex at all. Uh, but I do believe we, li we live in an era where truth has all of a sudden become complicated. All right, 
Uh, thank you for being on the show, man. I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Absolutely.